In our final podcast on basic genetics, we're going to talk about working with pedigrees. There are actually several websites that you can go to to help you design your own pedigrees. So I clicked on this one just to show you an example, and I'm going to click on the English translation. You can use this to design pedigrees. I'm going to go back now to our podcast. What you need to do is learn how to read pedigrees, and you want to know what first degree relatives are, second degree relatives, third degree relatives. I'm not going to go over the symbols on this chart. You should be able to learn these on your own. First thing you might ask is about degrees of relationships or what percentage of genes do people share in common. So if I asked you what percentage of genes do these two people that are highlighted by the arrows share in common, I hope you'd be able to calculate through the pedigree that they contain approximately 0.8% of their genes in common. The first thing to say is can you realize that they're third cousins? It would be first cousins, it would be second cousins, and it would be third cousins. Now, when you're looking at a pedigree like this, the first thing to do is exclude people that are not really in the family. So, in this instance, this person is not in the family except by marriage. But then, if you want to figure out what percentage of genes do these third cousins share in common, you can calculate back. And you can say, from that person to that person, they share half of their genes in common. Then, this person to this person, half the genes in common. This person to that person, half the genes in common. I hope you see what I'm doing. I'm trying to draw a straight line from one person to the other through the family tree, half in common. Again, half to half, half in common, half in common. So you can multiply all of this out. One half times 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 one half is approximately this fraction, 1 over 128, or 0.8 percent of their genes in common. So what did I do? I'm looking at the coefficient of relationship. Sometimes you can talk about consanguinity and the coefficient of relationship. But if you want to know what percentage of genes the individuals share in common, one way to do it is to just draw these direct connections through the family tree from one person to the other going through the related people. So from this person to that person, half of the genes are in common. From this person to that person, half of the genes are in common. From that person to that person, half of the genes are in common. That's the simple way to do it. The other is to actually calculate the coefficient of relationship. And what you would do is you would say, what is the relationship between A and E to each beginning point on the family tree? So A shares half of the genes in common with B. B shares half of the genes in common with F that grandparent. F shares half of the genes in common with D. That D shares half of the genes in common with E. And then do the same thing for the other side of the family tree going to that grandparent. So you got a half times a half times a half times a half. That's a sixteenth plus a half times a half times a half times a half a sixteenth. So one sixteenth plus one sixteenth, the two sixteenths or one eighth. So the simple way to do it is just draw the direct line between the individuals in the family tree. And for our course, it is okay to do that. You'd have to be careful here in the sense of saying the pedigree is actually reflecting what the true family history is. For that, we would mean, for example, that there's not a different relationship in the family. It is sometimes useful to know the degree of relationship between people in a family. Clearly identical twins share 100% genetic identity, maybe 20,000 genes in common. First degree relative is a parent to a child or a brother and a sister, 50% of the genes in common. Second degree relatives, grandparent to grandchild, aunt to uncle to niece, nephew, or half sibs, 25%. And you can go down and see what first cousins share in common, first cousins once removed, second cousins, etc. It's interesting to realize that the background risk for any 
birth defect in a population is something like 3%. So you think about it, second cousins marrying are not necessarily at a higher risk for any given birth defect than what's in the general population. Now, you do have to understand that if there's rare autosomal recessive diseases in a family, those diseases may be manifest. How close a relation can you marry? Well, it turns out that second cousins can legally marry in all 50 states in the United States. Here's an example. A brother and a sister here show symptoms of a genetic condition that's not seen in the family before. So what type of inheritance is this? Well, the first thing to note is consanguinity in a relationship. And consanguinity in a relationship, if you've never seen the disease before, suggests there may be an autosomal recessive mutation in the family. I've purposely pointed out that these individuals are carriers. So again, makes the point that there's an autosomal recessive condition in the family, what is the risk that these two parents, who happen to be cousins, will have another affected child? See, they have two affected children. What if they have a fifth child? What's the risk that that child will be affected? Well, you can do the Punnett square, and you'd say, for example, big A, little a, crossed big A, little a. What it would say is there's a 25% risk that their next child would also have the genetic condition as the two children they've already had. What percentage of genes do they share in common? Well, again, you can look at the degree of relationship, their cousins, so it would be one-eighth. So I'd go from this person to that person as a half from this person to this person is a half, so a half times a half is a fourth, and this person to this person is a half, so a half times a half times a half is an eighth, or 12% of the genes they share in common. This pedigree represents a family with a genetic disease. What can you conclude about the disease-causing mutation? Is it, for example, an X-linked disease? Is it an autosomal dominant disease? Is it an autosomal recessive disease or a mitochondrial disease? Looking at the pedigree, it suggests that there's vertical transmission. The disease is appearing in each generation. It's appearing in both men and women. It suggests that it's an autosomal dominant disease. So now another question. If the person in the third generation labeled it A marries an unaffected person not related to her, what is the risk that her child will have the same disorder that her cousins have? And we're going to assume here that it's complete penetrance. If it's an autosomal dominant condition with complete penetrance, she does not have the disease. That means she does not have the mutation. She marries someone not related to her. Then her children would have the background risk of having this disease. In other words, whatever the spontaneous mutation rate is, they would not have the risk that their cousins have of having the disease. Indeed, they probably wouldn't have the disease if it's a relatively rare disease. All of the individuals indicated here have the same genetic disease. What can you say about individual one in the second generation? Does he carry a recessive gene, a dominant gene, an X-linked gene, or does he not carry a disease-causing gene? Well, this one becomes rather interesting because you can see on this side of the family, it looks like autosomal dominant inheritance, and it looks like it's a vertical inheritance pattern. But here you wonder of no disease. His, his brother is showing the disease. He's not. But then he has two children with the disease. Is he a germline mosaic, potentially? Well, maybe he carries an autosomal dominant condition that shows reduced penetrance. And without any other clinical information, that would be the most likely conclusion in this case. You know, we're not saying any family history other than that. We're not giving you any indication of what the disease is. So he's likely got an autosomal dominant condition. He's inherited the diseased gene, but it's showing reduced penetrance. What about the two individuals in the third generation that are unaffected? Do they contain normal genes, mutant genes, or are they heterozygous? All you can really say is that these individuals have a normal phenotype. 
they could indeed have inherited the diseased or mutant gene, and depending on how penetrant it is, one would need to do genetic testing on these individuals to know if they have a likelihood of passing the disease to their offspring. What pattern of inheritance is shown here? An autosomal dominant, an autosomal recessive, an X-linked dominant, an X-linked recessive, or a Y-linked disease. It's interesting. We see only females affected. This suggests that it's an X-linked disease, and since we see a lot of aborted fetuses, it's probably an X-linked dominant disease, and the males probably died in utero. What type of inheritance pattern is shown in this pedigree? Here we're seeing inheritance only through the maternal individuals. This is likely a mitochondrial inheritance pattern. Here's another situation. This family has hemophilia A, and so we're indicating individuals with the disease. This individual happens to be deceased. These individuals are carriers. What is the risk that the unborn child is going to have this disease. So the first question to ask, hemophilia A, how is it inherited? Well, we know it's inherited in an X-linked manner. So can this child's mother be a carrier? And if so, what's her risk of being a carrier? You can work the Punnett square. She certainly could be a carrier. We know that her mother was a carrier. So we can say, well, her mother carrier represented like this, mating with her father. We know that she has a 50% chance of being a carrier. So if mom's a carrier, what's the likelihood that she passes the disease to her child? Well, it's a half, but you got to consider it's a half risk that she passes the disease to her child, but it's a half risk that she's a carrier, so it's a half times a half. But then, since it's an X-linked recessive gene, the person showing the disease has to be a boy, so it's a half times a half times a half. So it's a one-eighth chance that this unborn child is going to have the disease. Is a genetic disease in a family, what's the likelihood that the unborn child, shown with the red question mark, has the same condition as the proband? The proband is this individual marked with the arrow. This is the answer, 132nd, and this is finally working out the pedigree. What I'm going to do is work back and tell you how I would have come to that conclusion. So the first question I would ask is, what kind of inheritance or disease does the proband have? And if I look at the pedigree, the first thing I see is he has some type of a disease and his parents are in a consanguinous relationship. That suggests an autosomal recessive disease because it hasn't appeared anywhere else in the family. So I'll say he's little a, little a. The proband's parents must be carriers, I'll say the big A, little a, and I can represent them that way. The proband's grandfathers are also most likely carriers, big A, little a, so I can represent them like that. I don't know anything about the individuals they marry. So I'm going to assume, as you should assume in any situation, when you're trying to do a calculation, assume people that are outside the family are normal and not carriers. So I'm going to assume that this person's mate was normal, big A, big A. Likewise, she's normal, big A, big A. Likewise, these individuals are normal, big A, big A. We'll use that as kind of a ground rule if you're trying to solve a problem for our course. One of the proband's great grandparents is also likely to be a carrier. I haven't put it in on this pedigree because I don't know which one would be the carrier and it really isn't relevant to me trying to solve the question I'm asking. That is, what's the likelihood that the unborn child has the same condition as the proband? What I can do is start working some Punnett squares. We can say, well, if you cross a carrier with a normal individual, so I'm looking at this individual, for example, big A, little a crossed with big A, big A, that means this person has a one-half chance of being a carrier. That person shares one-half of their genes in common with that person. 
this person shares one half of their genes in common with that person and that person shares one half of their genes in common with that person that's this half of the pedigree now I'm gonna say this person going to here little a little a with big a big a I know that this person must be a carrier do the Punnett square that person has to be a carrier this person is a carrier and shares one half of the genes in common with that person so therefore I would say one half times one half times one half times one half times one is not relevant times one half is one thirty second so the likelihood that the unborn child shares the same condition as the proband is one out of thirty two and that's fortuitously interesting because one over thirty two is approximately three percent and as you remember three percent is the background risk that any child has for having any birth defect